All right, everyone, welcome to part three of my Cortex lecture. Now we're going to be uh, talking about Broadman's areas. So this dude named Broadman uh, had a microscope a long time ago. He took sections of all of these different regions of the cortex and looked at them. And based on the different uh, thicknesses of the different six cortical layers and the contents of these different layers, he numbered them different things. And he numbered these areas based on the sequence in which he looked at them. So there's no real significance to the number itself other than he just started with number one and went right on to number two and all the way through to number 37 or whatever. Uh, so um, the caveat here is that because there is a visual histological difference, that reflects in a functional difference. So the Broadman's areas... Uh, just so happen to reflect functional areas of the brain. And so we'll see that these functional areas can be correlated uh, based on the identification of symptoms in a patient. Uh, so uh, it's, it's common for neurologists to go around and say, oh, my patient has a deficit in 22. And neurologists will know what that means. Uh, because these areas relate to functional deficiencies and functional elements of the brain. So we have to learn these areas and understand what's going on within them. So starting off, I'll start with the um, primary uh, uh, processing areas of the cortex. So remember, like the uh, primary visual cortex, primary motor cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, these are the input areas for these different senses or the output area for the different function. And then they, this information travels, associates with other cortical regions. So we get um, some higher level uh, visual processing in an association visual cortex. And then from there, that information goes to other parts, other cortices, where multiple modalities of sensory information can be processed together. So it can all be synthesized and make sense in a holistic way. So there, we're gonna talk about primary uh, Broadman's areas. We're gonna talk about uh, unimodal association areas and multimodal association areas, as well as limbic and executive areas. So the primary areas we have here, uh, these are ones we talked about already. We have the motor cortex, which is labeled four by Broadman. It was the fourth area he looked at, so it makes sense that it's labeled four. So the precentral gyrus can be called the primary motor cortex, or it can also be called Broadman's area four. Then Broadman, well, not then, or before that, he looked at the, uh, the post-central gyrus, the primary somatosensory cortex, and he looked at uh, a couple of these sections and he said, okay, well, this is number one. And then he put it away. And the next day uh, he looked at other sections and he said, well, two, okay, so maybe it's a little bit different. And three, it looks a little bit different. So oh, three, but then he went to the primary motor cortex and he saw, oh, wow, this is just so different. So all of these in the post central gyrus are labeled one, two, three, because he didn't have an idea about what he was doing until actually he actually started doing it. So one, two, and three are the somatosensory, uh, primary sensory cortex. Then visual cortex, we've already, uh, you know, secretly been introduced to this nomenclature that this is area 17 around the calcarine sulcus and the posterior portion of the brain. Uh, so that is the primary visual cortex. Then we have a primary auditory cortex within the uh, insula the posterior most gyri of the insula, 41 and 42, are the primary auditory cortices. Uh, then the olfactory cortex uh, here in the parahippocampal gyrus is where all the olfactory sense goes into our uh, cortical awareness, our conscious awareness. So that is the primary olfactory cortex. Now let's talk about these unimodal association areas where uh, higher level processing occurs. We have a, uh, a, a uh, pre-motor or supplementary motor area uh, labeled six by Broadman. And so this is where motor planning occurs. Uh, 
it's where you know you bring together multiple different uh, motions and plan those out before they be, are executed by the primary motor cortex. We have a unimodal sensory area uh, labeled five here by Brodmann, just behind the postcentral gyrus. We have we already know the um, uh, the uh, secondary and associative um, uh, visual cortices. Uh, just uh, adjacent to 17, so these are 18 and 19. And we also have unimodal auditory uh, cortex labeled 22. This is also called Wernicke's area because it does multimodal association. Uh, so let's look at these multimodal areas now. Uh, we have an area called Broca's, 44 and 45, uh, which are the, where is it popping up? 44 and 45, which are the pars operculum and the pars triangularis, are the names of these gyri. Pars operculum because it is the part that's near the gill, the operculum, and then pars triangularis because it's the part that looks like a triangle more anteriorly. These Broca's association area is responsible for planning the movement of our lips and tongue to for speech output planning the output of speech with our mouths. So this is a very important area for uh, speaking and, and talking and singing and, and all of those kinds of auditory vocal outputs, our vocal cords as well. <clears throat> Wernicke's area, part of that what pathway. So when we get auditory information, it goes to this multimodal area so that the words that we're saying elicit a specific meaning in our Wernicke's area. So when I say a name of a thing like flower, then you know what a flower is, you understand its purpose, and you can visualize it because we're associating all that information together. I am stimulating a neural network throughout different cortical regions in your head when I say flower. I stimulated your auditory cortex when just hearing the word. I stimulated Wernicke's area where you're, uh, we're defining the word and uh, other parts of the temporal gyrus where we understand different parts of what a flower is. I'm stimulating your occipital cortex where you understand what the visual appearance of a flower is. I may also be stimulating parts of your prefrontal cortex where you might have a memory about picking a flower uh, and that motor output. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, maybe even your somatosensory cortex where you're feeling and smelling the flower, the olfactory, uh, Brodmann's area 28. Uh, so, uh, you know, I am controlling your cortex as much as you are by eliciting this information from it. And that's what these association areas do. They connect those different modalities of sense all at one time. So there's extended um, Wernicke's area responsible for different elements of of, um, of processing information and defining it. So extended Wernicke's area might be important for uh, written words and the stimulation of seeing a written word and then turning that into a meaning from our temporal cortex. So there's a part for auditory and there's a part for visual uh, association. Uh, then there are the semantic regions uh, in our temporal cortex, that's where names exist in our brains. Names of objects, names of things, you know, whatever, flower. The word flower exists in there. Uh, and then the, the uh, understanding of what a flower looks like exists in your occipital cortex, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is where the word flower exists in your uh, semantic region. And we also have, uh, kind of similar to Broca's area, we have the frontal eye fields uh, labeled eight. Frontal eye fields are the area where we plan uh, our gaze direction, the direction of our gaze. So that's responsible for those extraocular movements and planning those movements uh, to look at things in our visual field. So uh, next, moving on, so the limbic areas, uh, so Broca also looked at these limbic areas, and um, I uh, uh, and they have specific names for this course. 
I don't need you to know that information. Uh, you're not going to be tested on it, but know that it exists and you may encounter this information later as well as, so I'm highlighting some, so Cingulate Gyrus, for instance, uh, has a number of different numbers associated with it. And there are different functionalities in Cingulate Gyrus. The anterior Cingulate Gyrus has one function, the posterior has a different. Uh, so like anterior is more associated with pain and posterior is more associated with memory. And so all these different regions, uh, although they're the same gyrus, have different functionality and different name numbers from uh, Broadman's experiments or observations, I should say. Uh, and also executive functions in the uh, frontal cortex. Lots of different areas of the frontal cortex, all with different numbers. I don't need you to know the names of the executive or the limbic areas, but the rest of them, these names you will encounter again in the course and you will be tested on those areas and you'll have to uh, you know, elicit responses using these numbers. So um, the uh, primary, unimodal, and multimodal association areas you should definitely study those for the purpose of this course. As you progress through your clinical careers, the other areas uh, may or may not become more important as you encounter, uh, you know, patients or uh, colleagues uh, that specialize in these areas. So how do we get from this to functional uh, information? How do we elicit a motor response? What does complex uh, motor output, motor behavior look like? Well, we understand in the primary motor cortex, we have the homunculus and the motor homunculus and the sensory homunculus are closely uh, associated, but there are some differences. So for instance, in the medial portion of the, um, the primary motor cortex, on the medial side of the sagittal brain, we have um, neurons, Betz cells that represent the, the foot the toes, the leg, and as we go higher and, and more uh, ventral or, or more dorsal and more posterior, more lateral, then those areas head up through the uh, thorax, the trunk, the arm, and the um, more fine a control we have over an area, the larger that area is represented in the uh, homunculus. And then uh, kind of conversely, the sensory homunculus has its uh, specific shapes and, and areas as well. So what's the result of activating uh, a neuron in the primary motor cortex? And that result is simple motor output, like uh, the contraction of one motor neuron unit. So a, a handful of uh, muscle fiber cells contract when we uh, elicit uh, stimulation of one uh, Betz cell, one upper motor neuron. So for example, uh, flexing the finger uh, is the result of primary motor output. So how do we get complex output? So complex output is cued from the supplementary motor area, which is uh, area six. So the neurons in supplementary motor area, Broadman's area six, uh, cue together and, and fire in a sequence to cause a complex series of motor outputs. So we have six neurons via association fibers heading to area four neurons, and those area four neurons send their corticospinal tract fiber, you know, their corticospinal tract fibers down, and it sends the action potential down that fiber to the lower motor neuron, wherever it is, uh, whether it's a uh, cranial nerve, facial motor nucleus, motor nucleus thing or an, a lower motor neuron. So what does it look like? So instead of just one finger moving, you might be strumming your fingers, you know. Uh, so what does it look like when we only fire, only activate the supplementary motor area without activating the primary motor cortex? And that's when we visualize an action we're taking. So say you're a basketball player standing at the free throw line, you dribble the ball a few times, then you hold it there. You look up at the net and you visualize yourself performing the motion to throw the basketball through the hoop. And that visualization, and so you're not moving during that visualization, but you're visualizing yourself moving. And then you visualized a few times and you go for it and you actually output that planned motor output. So that visualization is what's happening in the SMA, is you're planning that, but you haven't released it yet, 
to the primary motor cortex. <clears throat> so let's take this example a little bit farther. Let's say we're playing tennis. Well, we need a couple things. First, we have to want to play tennis, which for me uh, never exists. I am not motivated to play tennis. So, uh, you know, I don't have this connection from my frontal cortex motivating me, making like choosing to play tennis. I don't choose to play tennis. So, uh, you know, areas 9 and 10, uh, some other areas of the, of the frontal cortex say, okay, I feel like playing tennis. I'm going to choose to go do that. So, then uh, that's, that choice, you know, is sent to the, uh, the supplementary motor area so I can plan out my movements to go play tennis. When I'm on the tennis court, I'm getting uh, visual information from the primary motor cortex. It's associating from 17 to 18 and 19. And we're associating that information up into the wear pathway in the parietal cortex, up into seven and five uh, of the supplementary uh, sensory cortex. And so that's telling us we're, we're seeing the ball as it's flying through the air towards us. And our cortices are saying, okay, that's a yellow circle. Or that's our occipital cortex. There's a yellow circle in my visual field. And then that's sending that information down to uh, the temporal cortex. And that yellow circle is a tennis ball. And your supplementary uh, five and seven are saying, that tennis ball is coming toward me. So now you are on the court, you have a tennis ball coming toward you, and you have to decide what to do. Uh, and you have to prep that motor plan in your uh, supplementary motor area. So are you choosing to cower and run away from the ball, or are you going to hit the ball because you've got a racket in your hand? So, uh, you know, we feel that racket in our hand, and we feel the uh, orientation of our body and where our body is in space in relation to the ball that we see in our visual field. We send that information up to the frontal cortex, to our eye field, so we can track the ball, the, so our gaze is aligned with the ball and we know precise information about where it is in space and how it's moving. And we send that information to the supplementary motor area so we can plan our movement in response to that. So we, uh, you know, we plan cocking back our arm and swinging the racket and we swing the racket and during that process we're outputting uh, that planned motor output through the, uh, the uh, primary motor cortex, and that's sending that signal down the corticospinal tracts. Uh, so that is complex motor behavior uh, and how all these association regions work together to uh, result in the choices and actions we, we ultimately end up taking based on the input of sensory information we have. So now let's take a look at how these areas result in language, language under, uh, understanding and language output. So there are two important areas. We've already talked about Broca's area and uh, Wernicke's area. Broca's area here, 44 and 45, as we already know, called pars opercularis and pars triangularis. These are responsible for planning that speech output, as I said. Wernicke's area uh, in area 22, just around the angle uh, of the, uh, the angular gyrus, uh, that is responsible for decoding the sounds we hear. <clears throat> so when, when we hear something that sounds like, that has the timbre and intonations, so are all of these fundamental elements of sound, pitch and f speed and timbre, are being processed in the primary auditory uh, cortex uh, uh, in the insula, posterior insula. And that information uh, is being transferred to these association areas. It's, and they send up the signal, that timbre and those pitches sound like human voice. So let's send that information to Wernicke's area, 22, and see if there's any sounds that we know have meaning. And so uh, Wernicke's area is saying that sequence of pitches and tones and that speed and velocity, uh, that is the sound of the word flower. And so then Wernicke's area uh, 
uh, you know, gets association information from the rest of the temporal cortex, occipital cortex, and you understand all of these aspects of flower. But the auditory uh, pattern is being decoded by Wernicke's area. So sometimes you might hear pitches and frequencies that sound like human voices. And uh, so your brain is sending that signal to Wernicke's area saying there's a human voice around, but it might just be the sound of air, you know, whooshing in your fan uh, on your ceiling or, you know, a car driving by and its engine is just the right pitch to cue that. Uh, so it's not actually a human voice. It's just that Wernicke's area has sent up that, that warning flag that you should be paying attention to this more directly. So <clears throat> what happens uh, if, uh, and then of course, okay, so I've highlighted the extended area. And so the extended area is for written word. And so depending upon, you know, the individual, you might uh, read written words and, you know, um, activate your auditory cortex in ways uh, when you read a word. So you're actually sounding it out in your head. And some people just associate a word with a concept without having to sound it out. And so, um, you know, this extended area is the area that is, um, is, is inferring information or conveying definitions from written uh, visual information. So what happens when we have damage to these areas of uh, the brain? So Broca's aphasia, if the motor planning for speech area is impacted, is, is for some, you know, there's a stroke in the uh, frontal portion of the MCA, then Broca's area will be impacted and uh, a person will be able to understand speech fully, but won't be able to output speech. So their fluency, uh, their output will be affected. Uh, their ability to repeat something you say will not be there. They can't repeat things, but they can understand what you say and they can understand that they're not repeating it correctly too because they can hear themselves. So uh, in extreme cases, these people might have problems writing as well because the, um, the, it might be affecting uh, other areas like 46 or, or area six that are associated with uh, writing or planning the muscle movements of the arm. Uh, so that can affect writing. And depending upon how they process written information, it can also affect their ability to read, but that's rare, but it does happen. Now, Wernicke's uh, aphasia is an inability to comprehend spoken words or in extreme cases, written words, where the angular artery of MCA is blocked or there's a thrombus or whatever. Uh, and maybe the um, parietal arteries of MCA are also impaired for writing. So uh, these people will have an inability to repeat what you say, whether you ask them to write it or whether you ask them to say it, uh, because they can't understand what you're saying. It's just garbly gook to them. And they speak and they believe that what they're saying is perfectly fluid. They think the problem is with you. They think that you are saying gibberish constantly. And so depending upon the size of the lesion, you might not even be able to write something to them and get them to read it. Um, you, they might not be able to comprehend written language. Um, and so it's also interesting, there are subregions of both Broca's and uh, Wernicke's responsible for uh, interpreting and outputting numbers. So numbers have their own specific region in the brain, uh, separate from language. So uh, here I've already kind of went through the pathway. The primary uh, auditory cortex sends information to Wernicke's, decodes it, other information, visual information for written stuff, or Braille, uh, if, you're, if you're using Braille, uh, feeling the, the letters and words, to the um, extended Wernicke's area and then uh, to Wernicke's, and Wernicke's sends information on how to respond uh, to uh, Broca's. So, you know, information upon, about what words we should be speaking, and then Broca's understands how to make those words uh, using our mouths. 
uh, and then we output that to the primary motor cortex so that we can actually speak. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, some, some really interesting stuff there, uh, but let's talk, so all of that happens in uh, the dominant hemisphere. Uh, dominant hemisphere uh, is uh, the speech and uh, output hemisphere uh, for understanding sounds and writing. Now there's the non-dominant hemisphere, and it does some uh, some interesting stuff as well. So Wernicke, so on the non-dominant, there are homologous areas, homologs, like Wernicke's homolog and Broca's homolog in the same areas. And so the understanding of the intonations of your voice, of things that are said, are performed in Wernicke's homolog in the non-dominant hemisphere. And the prosody of your voice, the sing-songy nature of what you say, is outputted in Broca's homolog in the non-dominant hemisphere. So also things like the inflections of sentences, questions, and stuff like that. The question mark at the end of a sentence, what does that mean? Uh, that's uh, performed by the homolog regions. The um, parietal lobe is also has different functionality from the dominant and non-dominant hemisphere. So um, the, um, the left hemisphere of the parietal lobe is responsible for more detail-focused, analytical understanding of what's going on in your spatial awareness. Uh, and it does so only on the right field. So your understanding of right space uh, is processed by your left parietal lobe, the, or, or the left uh, hemisphere. The right parietal lobe is responsible for holistic spatial processing across both hemispheres of your visual, of your visual fields. So uh, if you have uh, a lesion to the left hemisphere, a patient will not uh, exhibit any noticeable deficits because the right parietal uh, hemisphere, right parietal lobe, will cover is covering both of those areas of of wear space. But if you damage the right hemisphere, then there's no processing of the left visual left. Uh, what space, what uh, left where space going on in the patient. So this results in uh, hemispheric neglect, left hemispheric neglect. So a patient that has a, had a stroke of the right parietal branches of MCA is going to completely be unaware of anything in their left where processing. So this person will stand in front of the mirror and they will shave the right side of their face. And you'll uh, say, hey, are you done shaving? And they'll be like, yeah, I got a real good shave, but their left side will be bushy like a hippie. And so that's because they have no concept of what's on the left side of their spatial awareness. They don't have spatial awareness of leftedness. You, um, you walk them into a room and uh, you ask them to sit, you know, on the left side of the room and they'll go to the middle of the room and they'll sit on in the middle of the room because they don't have an awareness of what's on the left hand side of that room. You ask them to draw a circle and they will draw half of a circle and stop and oh, I drew a whole circle. Uh, so uh, they also, uh, this is common, especially in uh, older, uh, you know, uh, geriatric inpatient, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilities with this uh, hemispheric neglect. A patient with this problem, you know, you might have a little old lady uh, come and complain to you all night long. There was somebody else in my bed, some other hand, uh, you know, touching me in my bed. It was so disturbing. And you, you, you check with the nurses, this video, and there was nobody there. Uh, and uh, then you, uh, you pick up 
their left hand, and you say, was this the hand that was touching you? And they'll be like, yes, that was it. That was it. But they won't understand that that's their left hand because they don't have a concept of leftedness, of anything in the left spatial awareness. So I know that's kind of a confusing concept to wrap your head around. Let's move on, but just you know, understand that's the way it is. That's how our brain is processing uh, leftedness. And so this is where the concept of you know, left versus right brain comes from. Uh, there's, this is the extent of the neuroscience behind left and right brainedness. There's nothing else to it. Um, that's, that's it. But anyway, let's move on. We've already talked about the fusiform gyrus and its processing of facial features. Um, so the uh, left hemisphere, the, the left uh, fusiform gyrus, is responsible for classifying objects. And then the right hemisphere, or, or uh, so yeah, the left is responsible for classifying objects. The right is responsible for recognizing whether an object is familiar or not. Uh, so the right hemisphere, the right fusiform gyrus is saying, yes, that face, so I recognize that that's a face, but I don't know that it's a familiar face. I don't know that I've ever seen that face before. Uh, so they're not, they're not, it's not that they're not picking out individual features of a face necessarily. It's that they're not putting those features together in a holistic way and saying, I've seen those features in combination before. Uh, it can be, depending on the extent of damage, that they don't recognize features or that you know, they don't classify the object as a face. Um, so there's a, 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 a famous artist, uh, Chuck Close, who uh, has uh, prosopagnosia, but he paints um, uh, portraits, self-portraits, portraits of people he knows, and the way he does it is very interesting. Instead of just painting a, a whole face, what he does is he uh, makes a grid on the canvas and then paints tiny little aspects of the face, like, like pixel-sized portions of faces. And he can paint those tiny little aspects of the face and fill in all of the tiny little aspects and create a whole face, but he, he doesn't recognize the holistic nature of the face. It's very interesting. So uh, look those up if you're interested. He's given a talk at Society for Neuroscience in the past, several years ago, uh, but it, that will give you an idea about how an individual with prosopagnosia is still processing information, but is not putting the information together in an associative way. <clears throat> uh, so again, so here I told you, like a person drawing, uh, so somebody with this um, parietal, this, this is supposed to be with the parietal lobe stuff, so somebody with a parietal, you ask them to draw the face of a clock, and they'll draw in, okay, a face of a clock, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they'll stop at six and say, well, that's the end of the clock. There's nothing left to the clock. I've drawn an entire clock because they don't have an aspect of the leftedness. Uh, some patients might actually cognitively be aware that they're supposed to be up through 12 on a clock, and so they'll draw one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they'll get to like five and they'll be like, oh shit, there's not enough room for 12 more things. And so they just start writing really small, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and they'll go up the middle a little bit. And so that's another example of this uh, hemispatial neglect uh, from the parietal lobe uh, issues. So that's the clock drawing test of neglect. Uh, so <clears throat> now I wanna talk about a little bit more uh, about, I think this will give you an idea about how the brain processes information uh, a little bit better. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time in this lecture and talk about split brain subjects. So back in the day, you know, before we were as, uh, you know, humane as we are now or whatever, I, I'm, I'm not making a value statement, I'm just making a joke. Uh, back in the day, we used to perform lobotomies. Uh, for a, a lot of things. Uh, we used to also perform, uh, using a similar technique, uh, corpus callosotomies, where we would sever the corpus callosum right down the middle. Sometimes the lobotomy was performed on the rostrum and the genu of the corpus callosum. Uh, 
Um, but when this corpus callosotomy was done, it was usually to relieve um, uh, uh, seizures. And so it did a great job at relieving seizures uh, because then the seizure couldn't spread across hemispheres and, and the patient could still, you know, function during uh, a small amount of seizure activity that restricted itself to one hemisphere. Uh, so these patients, uh, they saw no deficits from this corpus callosotomy. There were no impairments to how the patient functioned or behaved. It just got rid of their seizures. Uh, but uh, when we give these split brain patients specific tests, we can uh, tool out uh, features that are at a deficit. And the reason in normal life they're not at a deficit is because we're constantly walking around, uh, you know, with both our eyes open, observing the information in both visual fields. The information is crossing over in the optical uh, tract to both hemispheres and the equal amount of information, the same information is going to both, uh, both cortices and associating across both hemispheres uh, without need for the, the corpus callosum in this case. But when we put these patients in front of a screen and ask them to gaze on a dot in the middle of the screen, we can flash words or images in one side of their uh, visual awareness or the other. And so we can send information in these split brain patients to only one hemisphere of their brain at a time. And so to get an idea about what this test is like, uh, I've got this slide here. Now direct your gaze on the dot in the middle of the field and in a moment I'm going to flash up for a very brief moment so that your eyes don't move and look at it very brief moment, a word, and it'll appear in only one visual field. There. So let's, let's go back and let's do that one more time. Boom. There. It's gone. <clears throat> so the word appeared spoon in the left side of this uh, scroll. Oh, no, it was the right side, wasn't it? Uh, so anyway, and there were, again in the left field, a different word appeared. Uh, so if your corpus callosum is severed, then you might not have conscious awareness uh, of the word, depending on which uh, visual field it appeared in. So, uh, we set this patient in front of this screen, and we flashed the word spoon into the right portion of the visual field. And so that projects to the left portion, the left hemisphere. <clears throat> we asked the patient to read the word that they saw on the screen. So, the page, that information goes to the left hemisphere, uh, Wernicke's, air, so the visual cortex sees it, sees it's a word, since it's to Wernicke's extended area, Wernicke's area, uh, transfers that information to Voca, Broca's area, they plan their motor output, and they say spoon. I saw spoon. Now, we send that information to the same patient with a split brain, a split corpus callosum, and but now it's in the left visual field and it's going to the right hemisphere. So will this information go to Broca's area? No, it will not. It will go to uh, the right uh, hemisphere and the Wernicke's homologue and Broca's homologue are not responsible for uh, uh, identifying the words and saying them. They're responsible for prosody. So if a patient really focuses and, and you know has good connections uh, for prosody, Maybe they can interpret those letters and say, um, spoon, maybe, I don't know, spoon, sure. Uh, they won't be able to say the actual word, but a, you know, a, a very adept person might be able to infer the prosody from the written letters. So, in this way, it is your left hemisphere that's interpreting information and, and talking to you. When you're talking to another person, you're talking to their left hemisphere, and they are their left hemisphere is the hemisphere speaking to you. So now we're going to ask these patients, they have their, they have their hand, their left hand, under the screen, and they can't see the objects on the table. So again, we flash spoon, or this is a different case, maybe a different patient, so they don't know the word with spoon.
They flash, we flash spoon in their right uh, visual field, goes to their left hemisphere, and we say pick up the object that you see written on the screen. So that information goes there, but their left hand is under the screen. Their left hand is controlled by their right hemisphere, their right uh, primary motor cortex, because the corticospinal tracts cross in the pyramidal decussation. Uh, or in the anterior white commissure, depending on whether it's, uh, you know, the, the um, anterior posterior corticospinal tract. So, uh, that patient cannot send the information that it's a spoon to their left hand. And they're feeling around under that screen, feeling the objects, but they can't interpret the feel of the object as, an, as the identity of an object, because identity is in the left hemisphere. So this person cannot pick up a spoon with their left hand. Now, the patient before that, that couldn't read the word, didn't know what the word was because it didn't go to their left hemisphere, we, uh, that patient, uh, we send that information same to the left visual field, to the right hemisphere, and they can't read the word, but we say pick up the object. They can't tell you what the word was but with their left hand, they can now feel and identify and pick up the spoon without consciously being aware of the name of the object because their hemispheres are disconnected. <clears throat> so he can do it. Now, uh, this can get even crazier, uh, and this goes to um, our understanding of the intention of, of our actions and how we... Uh, explain and rationalize our actions across our hemispheres. So uh, this person has, uh, in, the, in the you know split visual field, split brain, flashing these two pictures up, a picture of a chicken's foot and a snowy scene. And we say, point to the matching objects. Now remember, uh, the two hemispheres the, uh, are getting different information. So the right hand can only point to something that, that was in the uh, left hemisphere. And the left hand can only point to something in the right hemisphere. So we say point to the matching object. And so uh, the two images show up and we have the chicken foot going to the left, uh, the left hemisphere and outputting to the right hand and the right hand points to the chicken, the face of the chicken. Uh, now, the uh, left visual field going to the right hemisphere and the snowy scene, the left hand picks the shovel. So those things match. So even though the hemispheres were disconnected, each hemisphere of the body picked the right thing and, and responded correctly. Then you ask the person, why did they pick those two things? Why did they pick a chicken and a shovel? And the guy will say, well, the chicken goes with the chicken claw that I saw. And so the left hemisphere is responding appropriately and knows what it saw in the left hemisphere in the right visual space. But then why did you pick the shovel? And then they're like, the shovel? Um, because I need to clean out the chicken coop. I use it in the chicken coop on my farm. And just totally, uh, 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 you know, confabulates the story because the left hemisphere is the one telling you the story and the left hemisphere doesn't know anything about the snowy scene. And the snowy scene makes sense, the snow shovel for the snowy scene. Uh, so our left hemisphere, when something happens we don't understand, our left hemisphere uh, is going to uh, potentially make up a story about why we behave, why our right hemisphere did something if we're not sharing information across. So again, these are split brain subjects, uh, not typical, but it gives us an idea about what these different hemispheres are doing. Okay, uh, so uh, left hemisphere dominates. That's all I've got for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening.